There's blessings for the tribes. Yehovah shows Moshe the land, and then we have Moshe's death. So, <clears throat> we started with Bereshit 10 months ago. Uh, the, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Of course, they included pictures from when we went to the Lake District that people had taken. Isaiah thirty-seven sixteen. O Yehovah Zavayot, the God of Israel, who is enthroned above the cherubim, you are God, you alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth, you have made heaven and earth. And there's some of the pictures that people took. I can't even remember that bit. Hebrews 1.10, and you, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. I remember going through it and talking about celebrating Yehovah as the creator. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. Revelation 4.11, whether you, you, O Lord and God, to receive glory and honor, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. And then Psalm 8, a place we've all probably been. When I look at the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you've set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? Isaiah 66, 2. The Lord says, All these things my hand has made, and so all these things came to be, declares Yehovah. But this is the one to whom I will look. He who is humble and contrite in spirit, and who trembles at my word. So, hopefully, we are the people that are humble and contrite in spirit, and tremble at his word. John 1, 1. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with in God, and the Word was God. So, <clears throat> we've been through the whole Torah cycle once again, which is, of course, of great benefit. If you want to know the Creator, or who is the Creator of all things is, then read His Word. In the Word, we do discover exactly who it is we serve, in much the same way that we get to truly know someone by spending time with them. When we read His Word again and again, we get to know Him more and more intimately, his word is supernatural, and through it, Yehovah continues to teach us, to amaze us, to challenge us, and to encourage us. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. I think it's interesting, the word is living and active. And faith comes by hearing or shimmering, and shimmering by what? By the word of God. And Yehovah's people are, of course, a Shema people, a people of faith, a people that love His Word. And the Word changes those who have faith and belief. We thank God constantly for this, that when you receive the Word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the Word of men, but as what it really is, the Word of God, which is at work in you believers. The Word lets us know where we're at. If anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. He looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. So, <clears throat> think of all the people who have a copy of the Bible and don't read it. You probably all know tons of people who've got... Bibles in their houses, don't never even pick it up. But we read in Psalm 119, the entrance of your word brings light and understanding to the simple. People have no regard for it. Events, <clears throat> of course, are documented in the word that are for our benefit, 1 Corinthians 10. These things took place as examples for us that we might not desire evil as they did. Don't be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Referencing, of course, the golden calf incident. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did. And 23,000 fell in a single day. They were seduced into idolatry. And these things are written down for our benefit. 
We've not, not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents. Not grumble of some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer, which is a reference to the people spake against God and Moshe and said, our soul loathes this light bread, which we've looked at before is kind of like um, we can see that attitude in people who grow tired of the word. It's not enough for them and they go after other things. Now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. We read in Psalm 119, the Lord of your mouth is better to me than thousands of gold and silver pieces. The Lord is holy, the commandment is holy and righteous and good. So people ask why focus on the Torah so intently. Spake Yeshua to the multitude, to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moshe's seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do not you do after their works, for they say and they do not. So this is Yeshua. And most people who come with this claim of, oh, you spend too much time focusing on the Torah, or people who claim to follow Yeshua, Yeshua said, hang on, you listen to the people who are sitting in Moshe's seat and do whatsoever they bid you. Of course, <clears throat> what did they do when they sat in Moshe's seat? They read the Torah. The Torah teaches us how to live. It defines for us what sin is. Whoever commits sin transgresses also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. And we read, the Son of Man will send his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers. So it's very handy, isn't it, to know what sin is? And throw them into the fire, the fiery furnace, rather, in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So many people have a very um, flimsy, um, non-concrete idea of what sin is. Um, if you actually get in conversation with people and ask them, it can be quite interesting. But most people who follow you, Jesus, <clears throat> they don't actually see the value and what we've just done this year, which is to go right the way through the Torah. David, a man after Yehovah's own heart, according to Acts 13, 22, saw the value of the word. He meditated on the Torah all day. He says, oh, I will love your Lord. It is my med meditation all the day. My eyes are awake before the watches of the night that I may meditate on your promise. David also wrote that Yehovah was his shepherd. Yehovah is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. How does he leave us? Direct my steps by your word. Let no iniquity of dominion over me. And of course, Torah is not just the law. Its root word, Yerah, means to point out a direction. So Torah is the way pointed out. It is incredibly valuable for us to study the Torah every Sabbath. Psalm 37, take delight in Yehovah and he will give you the desires of your heart. Yehovah makes firm the steps of the one who delights in him. Though he may stumble, he will not fall, for Yehovah upholds him with his hand. And we read, the mouth of the righteous utter wisdom and their tongues speak what is just. The law of their God is in their hearts, their feet do not slip. We see from Psalm 37 that the one who delights in Yehovah is righteous. And we read, the law of their God is in their hearts. That is, they delight in the law. So to delight in Yehovah is to delight in his Torah. The Psalm tells us that Yehovah delights in these people who delight in his Torah and they will not stumble. To delight in Yehovah is to delight in his Torah. And we read in Psalm 1, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight 
is in the law of Yehovah, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. Be a doer of the word, and know life. Deuteronomy 32, be careful to do all the words of this law. It is no empty word for you, but your very life. James addresses the council. Therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God, but should write to them to abstain from the things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, and from what has been strangled and from blood. In other words, tell them not to be going through with all these pagan practices. He says, but don't make it difficult for them, for from ancient times or ancient generations, Moshe has had in every city those who proclaim him, for he has read every Sabbath in the congregations. And indeed, <clears throat> here we are on the Sabbath reading Moshe. And today we come to the end of Deuteronomy. <clears throat> now, most of this book is written in the first person as it includes the parting words which Moshe addresses to the nation just a matter of weeks before his death. And the book contains four defined speeches of Moshe. You can break it up in different ways, but this is um, one way. History lessons, the main speech containing the commandments in the land, the renewal of the covenant, and then a call for repentance. So, <clears throat> in summary, Deuteronomy, aside from the retelling of various commandments and statutes and mishpatim, I think it's interesting to see all these things laid down in order, the whole book, to get a flavor of the whole book. Don't add or take away from the commandments and remember, but all pure. Israel's a great nation. Yehovah is near. They have the Torah. Let them hear the word so that they may learn the fear of Yehovah. Do not forget the covenant. Yehovah is a jealous God. You will go after false gods. You will be scattered. You will be in tribulation. Then you will return to Shema, Yehovah. Take care lest you forget Yehovah. You shall not go after other gods, the gods of the peoples who are around you. Yehovah is a jealous God. When you enter the land, be set apart. Do not intermarry lest you turn to serve other gods. Smash down the altars and Asherim. You are holy to Yehovah. On the heels of Shema'ing, Shema'ing and Asaring the word, he has loved you, blessed you, blessed are you above all people. Yehovah will take away from you all sickness. Don't serve their gods, for that would be a snare to you. Remember, Zechariah, what Yehovah your God did to Pharaoh and to all Egypt. The carved images of their gods you shall burn with fire. They are an abomination to Yehovah your God. You shall not bring an abominable thing into your house. Remember that it is Yehovah who has given us the ability to produce wealth. If you forget Yehovah and go after other gods, you will perish. Yehovah your God is not giving you this good land to possess because of your righteousness, for you are a stubborn people. You are required to fear, love, and serve Yehovah with all your heart and with all your soul, cherishing all his commandments and statutes. Take care lest your heart be deceived and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. You will perish. Blessings if you obey the commandments of Yehovah. Curses if you do not obey the commandments of Yehovah and go after other gods. Destroy pagan worship sites. You shall not worship Yehovah your God in that way. Do not inquire about their gods, saying, How did these nations serve their gods, that I also may do the same? You shall not add to it or take away from what Yehovah commands. And if a prophet or a dreamer of dreams tries to get you to go after other gods, do not listen, put them to death. Yehovah is testing to see if you love him. If your brother or child or wife tries to lead you after other gods, you shall put them to death. Any city that goes after false gods, put to death the inhabitants and burn the city. If any amongst you goes and serves other gods, stone them. Then we have the promise of Yeshua. Blessings for obedience, curse, curses for disobedience, the renewal of the covenant, another warning about going after false gods, promise of return from exile when there is true repentance, and then a call to choose life. And that's kind of given us a real flavor <clears throat> of the book 
of Deuteronomy. You can see how many times it's saying, stick to the word, do not forget Jehovah, don't go after other gods. And after all that, we read, this people will rise and whore after the foreign gods among them in the land that they are entering after all that. How many times does he say, don't do that? And it's exactly what they're going to do. They will forsake me and break my covenant that I've made with them. So the people will show themselves to be very keen with their sacrifices and religious rites, yet their hearts will not be true to Yehovah. And it's, people don't really change. There's so many people who are interested in the paraphernalia and the religious rites and the observances, yet when it actually comes to it and they're tested, they don't put Yehovah first. They set up idols in their hearts. Their hearts are not true to Yehovah. They make a play of being his people, and we see this throughout their history. But Yehovah will not be enough for them, and they will play the whore. Verse 18, and I will surely hide my face in that day because of all the evil that they have done, because they have turned to other gods after all they were warned about. Now, therefore, write this song and teach it to the people of Israel. Put it in their mouths that this song may be a witness for me against the people of Israel. And when many evils and troubles have come upon them, this song shall confront them as a witness, for it will live unforgotten in the mouths of their offspring. So Moshe wrote this song the same day and taught it to the people of Israel. Then Moshe spoke the words of this song until they were finished in the ears of all the assembly of Israel. And the song describes Jehovah's people in many terms that are not glowing. They're blemished. They are a crooked and twisted generation. They are referred to as you foolish and senseless people. They stared him to jealousy with strange gods. You forgot the God who gave you birth. They are a perverse generation, children in whom is no faithfulness. They are a nation void of counsel. There is no understanding in them. The song describes the events that demonstrate Yehovah's great frustration with his people, but also his great compassion for them. They've made me jealous with what is no God. I will heap disasters upon them. Outdoors the sword shall bereave, and indoors terror. Speaking of the enemies of people, he says, Vengeance is mine and recompense for the time when their foot shall slip. And then we read, Yehovah will vindicate his people and have compassion on his servants when he sees that their power is gone. He avenges the blood of his children and takes vengeance on his adversaries. So <clears throat> that leads us right up to today's Parsha, which begins with, this is the blessing wherewith Moshe, the man of God, blessed the children of Israel before his death. And this is the only place in the Torah where Moshe is referred to as the man of Elohim. It is a common phrase that is found elsewhere in the Hebrew Scripture as a title for prophets, though, 1 Kings 17, 18. So she said to Elijah, what have I to do with you, O man of Elohim? Torah's account of the story of man's relationship <coughs> with Yehovah began with a blessing then. So <clears throat> right at the beginning of the Torah, we have a blessing, and we have one right at the end. Today's Parsha. We end with this blessing. So at the beginning of Torah, when Elohim created and breathed life into Adam, it tells us that, Genesis 1, 28, Yehovah blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth, subdue it, take dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the ground. At the time this blessing was spoken, Yehovah was prepared in a garden, which the man Adam was commissioned to Abad to tend to, and Shema to guard and keep watch over. Now Yehovah is prepared in the land of Israel as a garden for the people of Israel to do the same, to take care of, to cherish, and to look after. And just as these people were about to be led into the promised land by Joshua, just as these people were about to go in and see great victory, so we who wait for Yehovah are to be led once more into the promises of Yehovah. So this all points to something that is yet to come. For now we await our king and we prepare ourselves. So the concluding blessing, this differs from the original blessing of Yehovah and that it was not spoken over all Adam, over all mankind. Moshe's final blessing is spoken only over Israel. The tribes descended from Yaakov have been separated out from the rest of mankind. 
Yehovah has, through the events recorded in Torah, set apart, made holy the descendants of Adam into two factions. You've got Israel on the one hand and the Goyim, or nations, on the other. And this is the, <clears throat> the way it still is. The tribes descended from Yaakov were ordained to be a light to the Gentiles, to encourage and lead them back to relationship with Yehovah. It has always been that Yehovah's plan should be that we should be a light for the lost. We see in Isaiah 42, 6, I, Yehovah, have called you in righteousness, will hold your hand, I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the nations. We are called to be a light to the lost. You see in Acts 13, 47, for so the Lord has commanded us saying, referencing what we've read, I have made you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And Shua said to us, you are the light of the world. Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. And of course, it is the word that equips us for every good work. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work work. So we're called by Yeshua, our Messiah, to be a light to the world, to the people who are lost. And the reason, uh, the, the way we do it, the way we let our light shine is by good works, which as we see is a reference to walking in accordance with the word. And Paul writes about being a light in a twisted world in Philippians 2. It says, therefore, my beloved, as you've always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world holding fast to what? To the word of life. So in the day of the Messiah, I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. And he's referencing there his labor over teaching these people and bringing them um, to repentance and to um, turn into Yeshua and Yehovah. They are called to be children of the light, Ephesians 5, 8. At one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. 1 John um, 1. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and we do not practice the truth. Of course, the truth is a reference to the word. And I recommend reading the rest of those passages when you get a chance. To walk in the light is to practice the truth, the word. Proverbs 6.23, for the commandment is a lamp and the law is light and reproofs of instruction are the way of life. Walk as children as a light then is walk as children of the word. John 8.12, Yeshua spoke to them again saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. 1 Peter 2.9. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Which is pretty remarkable, really, isn't it? I was talking with Keith. Um, Keith um, is over, for people who don't know. <laughs> and uh, he was saying how amazing it is that we... Um, we get to know Yehovah's feasts and we get to do them. Um, you think about it, there's all these people who have no idea, all these people who walk um, in darkness. And we get to walk in his word. We get to keep his commandments. And by that, we get to know who he is. We get to have this relationship with him to be his people and to be incredibly blessed. And we are to draw men to Yehovah by walking according to his word. Therefore, we are ambassadors for the Messiah, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. So, starting again with this Parsha. This is the blessing wherewith Moshe, the man of God, blessed the children of Israel before his death. 
And he said, Jehovah, I came from Sinai and rose up from Seir unto them. He shined forth from Mount Paran, and he came with ten thousands of saints. From his right hand went a fiery law for them. Yea, he loved the people, all his saints are in thy hand. And they sat down at thy feet, every one shall receive of thy words. Moshe commanded as a law, even the inheritance of the congregation of Yaakov. So, before mentioning the giving of the Torah, uh, we read, Yea, he loved the people, all his saints are in thy hand. And they sat down at thy feet, every one shall receive of thy words. We see similar imagery in Isaiah, Isaiah 49. Can a woman forget her nursing child, that she should have no compassion on the son of her womb? Even these may forget, yet I will not forget you. Behold, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. So these verses are speaking of Jehovah's profound love for his people. Can a, a woman forget her nursing child? No, I'm not going to forget you. In Deuteronomy 33, three, we're invited to see the giving of Torah in the context of Jehovah's great love for us. Deuteronomy 4 says, well, What great nation is there that is a God so near to it as Jehovah our God is to us whenever we call upon him? And what great nation is there that has statutes and rules so righteous as all this law that I set before you today? We, Israel, we have the Torah and we are tremendously blessed. And when we think about the Torah, we think about it in the context of Jehovah's great love for us. We were Gentiles of the nations when we were alienated from Yeshua, but we're not anymore. And now we are of the commonwealth of Israel. We are of the nation. Of course, through the work of Yeshua. Therefore, remember at one time, you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision, by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from the Messiah, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. So now we have hope. Now we are not strangers to the covenants of promise. And now we are of Israel, no longer um, separated from Yeshua, we were no longer strangers to the covenants of promise. And of course, Galatians 3.29, if you are the Messiahs, you are Abraham's offspring and heirs according to the promise. We have the eternal word of Yehovah and an understanding of who he is. And as Abraham's seed, we are incredibly blessed. And getting back to the Parsha, Moshe commanded us a law, even the inheritance the Morashah of the congregation of Yaakov. And Moshe describes Torah as an inheritance, and Morashah passed down to the congregation of Yaakov, Israel. To understand this inheritance, let's first take a look at a more common Hebrew word for inheritance, Nachala. Nachala is related to Nachal, a word for a river or a stream. Nachala signifies something passed down automatically across the generations, as a river's waters flows downstream. Um, on the other hand, the word used in Deuteronomy 33.3, Morashah, to describe the inheritance of Torah, describes something to which you have legitimate title, but which you need to react to in order to acquire. The inherited position, the Nachalah, of the high priest was handed down from father to son. As a teacher, Moshe was able to hound down the promise of the inheritance, the Morashah, to those who chose to become disciples of the Torah. For those of us who do indeed walk in the Torah, who are Israel, who are Yeshua's Abraham's seed, who are heirs according to promise, then there is also a physical inheritance that accompanies submitting to Yehovah's Torah. The acceptance of Torah includes the acquisition of a promised land and it goes all the way back to Abraham in Genesis 12, 7. The first uses of the noun Morashah in Torah is found in Exodus 6, uh, where Yehovah said, I will bring you in unto the land concerning the which I did swear to give it to Abraham, to Yitzhak, and to Yaakov, and I will give it to you for an heritage, a Morashah, I am Yehovah. As Israel, Yehovah's people, Torah is our inheritance if we respond to it, of course, as well as the land promised. We have been in exile all our lives, but our king is coming back to take us into the land to dwell in his house forever. 
And I don't know about you, but it's like every week goes by, I look forward to that more and more. <laughs> it's like, can it be soon? <laughs> Getting back to the Torah portion, Moshe commanded as a law, even the inheritance of the congregation of Yaakov. And he was king in Jeshurun, when the heads of the people and the tribes of Israel were gathered together. And Jeshurun is a poetic name for Israel. The name Jeshurun comes from Yesar, meaning to be level, straight, and upright, suggesting that this is a name that can be used to describe the people when they walk in righteousness. And that verse remembers the day that Jehovah was made king by the people at the covenant acceptance ceremony at Sinai. In Exodus 24, we read, and he said to Moshe, come up unto the Lord thou and Aaron, Nadav, and Avihu, and seventy the elders of Israel, and worship ye afar off. And Moshe alone shall come near the Lord, but they shall not come nigh, neither shall the people go up with him. And Moshe came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments, the Mishpah team, and all the people answered with one voice and said, all the words which Yehovah has said, we will do. That was their first response. And the full contents of the terms of the covenant consisted, of course, of both the 10 words of Exodus 20 and all the Mishpah team. And Moshe wrote all the words of the Lord and rose up early in the morning and builded an altar under the hill and twelve pillars according to the twelve tribes of Israel. And he sent young men of the children of Israel, which offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen unto the Lord. And Moshe took half of the blood and put it in basins, and half of the blood he sprinkled on the altar. And he took the book of the covenant and he read in the audience of the people, and they said, All that the Lord has said, we will do and be obedient. So they replied, all that Yehovah has declared, na'asa v'nishma, we will asa, we will do it, and we will shema. That is everything that he said. We will hearken to it, and we will do it. Back in Exodus 19, we read that Yehovah had said specifically, if when you shema my voice and shema my covenant, then you will be my treasured possession, my people, my kingdom of priests, my holy people. Jehovah had told him exactly what response was required, and yet they had re replied, they answered together, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moshe reported the words to Jehovah. But here in Exodus 24, the first response was similar. When they said, Moshe came and told the people all the words of the Lord, all the judgments, the Mishpah team, and all the people answered with one voice and said, all the words which the Lord has said, we will do. We will do, na'asa, we will asa, we will make it happen, we will do it. Yelvah did not, does not want a bunch of people treating his instructions as they were commandments which had to be grudgingly performed or fulfilled. So finally, we get the appropriate response in Exodus 24. I won't, I won't butcher it, don't worry. We will asa and we will shema. So to shema is much more than just agreeing to follow a bunch of rules and commandments. To shema is to humble yourself and to be his servant. What you say, I will do. To shema or to hearken sometimes, not about individual acts of obedience. It's about where your heart is at. It's about recognizing who Yehovah is, who you are, and then humbling yourself before him. And Moshe took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you concerning all these words. Notice the words Moshe used to describe the blood that was sprinkled on them. This is the blood of the covenant. The covenant they have agreed to is that they will shema Yehovah, hearkening to his voice, walking in obedience to him in all things. The Torah is not the covenant. The covenant involved the promise to Shema all that Yehovah says, and that obviously includes all of the Torah. That was the first covenant, and in the second covenant, we have his Torah written on our hearts, Hebrews 8.10. This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. For those who think that the Torah is done away with or that we only keep a certain portion of it, Deuteronomy 30 says, It shall come to pass when all these things are come upon thee, the blessing and the curse, which I have set before thee, and thou shalt call them to mind among all the nations where the Yehovah, thy God, has driven thee. 
And you return, you repent, Yehovah your God, you and your children, and shema his voice in all that I command you today, with all your heart, with all your soul. Then Yehovah, your God, will restore your fortunes and have mercy on you. He will gather you again from all the peoples where Yehovah, your God, has scattered you. And you shall again shema the voice of Yehovah and keep all his commandments that I command you today. That I command you today. So that includes all of it. Right up to this point, just before Moshe's death, including the ten words, the Mishpatim, and the Chukim. Yelvah, your God, will make you abundantly prosperous, for Yelvah will again take delight in prospering you. When, when you shema the voice of Yehovah, your God, to keep his commandments and his statutes that are written in this book of the law, when you turn to Yehovah, your God, with all your heart and with all your soul. So please note, Moshe prophesied that in the latter days, exiled Israelites would return to Yehovah in repentance and obey the Torah. They would shema his voice. Moshe was very specific when he stated how Yehovah's people would return in the latter days. Return to Yehovah, your God, you and your children, and shema his voice in all that I command you today. Which Torah will his people obey in the latter days? The Torah that I command you today. I've never, I can't imagine. I've shown this to people, though, and they kind of still don't get it. And I don't understand how people can still refute um, that Yehovah calls his people to walk in his ways and that it actually matters today. It's not some antiquated code of practice that we don't have to worry about anymore. It's so clear, and yet people still have a problem. Moshe prophesied that in the latter days, Yehovah's people in all the nations of the world would return to the Torah, all of it. Which answers anyone who would say the Torah was abolished after Yeshua's death and resurrection, or anyone who thinks we only keep the commandments up to Exodus 24. Going back to the Torah portion, let's jump ahead to verse 26. There is none like God, O Jeshruin, who rides through the heavens to your help through the skies in his majesty. The eternal God is your dwelling place, and underneath are the everlasting arms. He thrust out the enemy before you, and he said, destroy so Israel shall dwell in safety. Yaakov shall be alone in a land of grain and wine, whose heavens drop down dew. Please note, he shall thrust out Gerash, and Israel shall dwell Shekan. Two words in that passage which detail the expulsion of the enemy and Israel's return to reside in the land. Thrust out Gerash, the enemy before you, Israel shall dwell Shekan in safety. The combination of these verbs appears in only one other occasion in the Torah. It's in Genesis 3.24. He drove out Garash, the man, uh, at the east of the Garden of Eden. He caused to dwell Shekan, the cherubim, and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. So the Torah seems to be making an association between the banishment of Adam from the garden at the beginning of the Torah and Israel returning to the land to settle at the end of the Torah. Thus we see Yehovah's plan for restoring mankind after his exile. The inheritance of the land closes the circle that began when man was expelled from the Garden of Eden. And we see patterns described in Genesis 3.24 and Deuteronomy 33.27-28 reoccurring in Revelation. The book of Genesis is indeed full of themes that seem to echo right through the rest of Scripture throughout the rest of history. Even within the book of Genesis itself, we see stories and themes that echo. Genesis 12, there was a famine in the land and Avram went into Egypt to sojourn there for the famine was grievous in the land. And we see Sarah taken into Pharaoh's house and he entreated Abram well for her sake and he had sheep and oxen and he asses and men servants and maid servants and she asses and camels. And the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarah, Abram's wife. So we have a famine, Egypt, Pharaoh's house, we have plagues. And Abraham leaves laden down with goods, obviously all pointing us to the Israelites when they were in Egypt. Very familiar. <clears throat> You have Jacob and his sons, and the ongoing theme of garments and deception begins. Yaakov dresses up like Esau, 
We have Yaakov deceived by Levan into marrying Leah. He was deceived by his sons into thinking Joseph is dead when they presented his garment covered in blood. Judah, indeed, is tricked by Tamar, who dresses up like a prostitute. And just as the events of Abraham's time in Egypt are a precursor to the Exodus account, so also we can see the similarities in the story of Yaakov and Levan. We have these echoes right throughout the Torah. Yaakov worked for Levan, just as the people of Israel worked for Pharaoh. Jehovah saw Yaakov's bondage, just as he saw the people of Israel's subjugation in Egypt. Yaakov's family multiplied greatly in Haran, just as the people of Israel pr proliferated abundantly in Egypt. Yaakov fled Levan, just as the people of Israel fled from Pharaoh. Levan is told that Yaakov fled, just as Pharaoh was told that the people of Israel had fled. Levan pursued after Yaakov, just as Pharaoh pursued after the people of Israel. Exile and return. We see that we have stories and themes that play out again and again. And a major one is exile and return. Exile and return features heavily in Israel's history. Returning and rebuilding, we see Nehemiah. We see even the rediscovering of the, the word. And Ezra reads the word and they bow in worship. And the people wept when they heard the words of the Torah. And all these things point to things, don't they? This points us to um, <clears throat> our own experiences indeed. So we have the big picture of the entire word of Yehovah. In the garden, everything was good. Yehovah walked in the garden, there was no death. Then we have a twisting of the word, deceit, by the serpent. Then we have desire, sin, and the fall. And sandwiched in between the fall and the exile, we find Yehovah's plan of redemption. And then we have Adam and Eve banished from the garden and from the tree of life. And then right at the end, Revelation 22 Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. Bringing it right back to the tree of life. So the big picture of the entire word of Yehovah, man kicked out of the garden, man returns. And I've put this up before, and um, we'll just quickly, quickly run through it again. The reason I think this is important is because it, it helps us to realize um, that it's not about the here and now. It's not all about us. It's all about Yehovah and his plan, his plan of redemption. So it all begins in uh, early Genesis 1 to 3. We have creation. We have the garden. And, of course, um, we have man led astray. We have the, um, the promise um, of um, redemption. And then we have the banishment from the garden. So paradise twisting and added to the word, the fall, the promise of the Messiah and exile. And then Genesis 4 to 11, we see stories like Cain and Abel. We have the, the great flood and we have the Tower of Babel. So what we see here is mankind refusing to seek restoration with Yehovah. Which brings us to Genesis 12 and Abraham. Um, and he is promised um, land and people. And of course, we have this great telling of um, what happened to the people, his descendants, um, the people of Israel. We see them taken captive. They, um, they escape from Egypt's clutches, taken into the wilderness, given the Torah. Many of them refuse um, to walk in obedience. They die, the first generation in the wilderness. The second generation enter into the land victorious. And this is the land we see here. that ends up being split into two, the southern kingdom of Judah, the northern kingdom of Israel. The people, um, this is where they reject Yehovah as their God and ask for a king for themselves. And then, of course, we see that the northern kingdom get taken away into captivity. And indeed, Judah get taken to Babylon in 587 BC. Of course, they come back to the land. And then we have the account of Yeshua and his first coming. We have the account of him um, giving his life freely. But then we have the great news of his resurrection. And of course, before he left his disciples, 
He spoke to them of the restoration of the kingdom. We have the giving of the Spirit at Pentecost. And then after that, not long after that, we see the sacking um, of the temple. Um, and Judah dispersed. And of course, you are here <clears throat> at this point in time waiting for the return of the Messiah. Waiting for, as it were, a return to the garden. Revelation 22, 14. Bless the day that do his commandments that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gate into the city. And as I say, <clears throat> sometimes it's easy to get caught up in the here and now and to think, to lose perspective um, of the fact that really what is important is Jehovah's will and his purpose. Abraham trusted Jehovah and he looked forward to the day of return. In Hebrews 11, we read, By faith he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Yitzhak and Yaakov, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. Abraham looked forward to what all his descendants looked forward to, living in the promised land, not as a foreigner, but as one settled there by Jehovah, living there and knowing Jehovah's blessings. He was looking forward to the city of Jehovah. Revelation 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. The sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. And he was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down for these words are trustworthy and true. So let's go back to Deuteronomy 33. The chapter ends. Happy, or Asher, blessed are you, O Israel, who is like you, a people saved by Yehovah, the shield of your help and the sword of your triumph. Your enemies shall come fawning to you, and you shall tread upon their backs. Blessed are you, O Israel, who is like you. Yehovah is with you. In Hebrews 13, it says this. Keep your life free from love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. Yehovah is indeed with you. So we can confidently say, Yehovah, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? So the question is, do you trust Yehovah? Do those words mean something to you? Yeshua HaMashiach is the same yesterday and today and forever. Circumstances might change, but he does not. And we read this. Do not be led away by diverse and strange teachings, for it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods which have not benefited those devoted to them. Just think of all the nonsense that people obsess about rather than devoting themselves to the Word. And then it says this. For here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. As Abraham's seed, we look forward just as he did. Through him then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Do not neglect to do good, to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. So, blessed are you, O Israel, who is like you. Yehovah is with you. He has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Praise your God with the fruit of your lips. Acknowledge him. Do good and share. This will please him. So, <clears throat> things to bear in mind um, for those of us, hopefully all of us, who do indeed look forward to the city that is to come. Now, Moshe, <clears throat> he didn't get to go into the promised land We'll finish part one by looking at him, getting his chance to see the land. I believe this was um, the place where he would have been, Mount Nebo. 
Now, chapter 34 then. Moshe went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo to the top of Pisgah, which is opposite Jericho. And Yehovah showed him all the land Gilead as far as Dan. All Naphti, the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, all the land of Judah as far as the Western Sea. Then Agab in the plain, that is the valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees as far as Zoar. And Yehovah said to him, this is the land of which I swore to Abraham, to Yitzhak and Yaakov. I will give it to your offspring. I have let you see it with your eyes, but you shall not go over there. Now, some parts of the land are not viewable from this mountain. This verse actually tells us that Yehovah showed him by giving him a perspective that otherwise would not have been possible. So since Yehovah was giving him eyes to see, which can also imply a spiritual vision, what else might Moshe have actually perceived? And there's an interesting phrase in Deuteronomy 34 too. It says, All Naphtali, the land of Ephraim, and Manasseh, all the land of Judah, as far as the Western Sea. You see that that phrase can also be interpreted the last day. So it could be all Naphtali, the land of Ephraim, and Manasseh, all the land of Judah, as far as the last day. So Moshe, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. It's no surprise that Moshe is called the servant of Yehovah. And it may be a surprise to you that this is the very first time in Torah that he's given this title. He lived his life devoted to the one that he loved. And the question is, can you be described as a servant or slave of Yehovah? 1 Samuel 12 tells us, only fear the Lord and serve him faithfully with all your heart. And then this, you consider what great things he has done for you. Now bear in mind that a servant, a slave of Yehovah, is a slave of righteousness. Romans 6. Do you not know that all of us who've been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, with the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we've been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For the one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe we also live with him. And having been set free from sin, which we now know what it is, have become servants of righteousness. And now that you've been set free from sin and become servants of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Eternal life. An heir to the promises, being a part of his nation, being able to go in to the land, into the city, to be his people, to be where he dwells. Moshe the servant of the Lord. Moshe was a servant of righteousness. Moshe, who was described as the most humble man on the earth, very meek more than all the people on the face of the earth. And of course, to be meek in Yehovah's reckoning is to be blessed because he leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. And Deuteronomy 34 continues and says, He buried him in the valley in the land of Moab opposite Beth Peor, but no one knows the place of his burial to this day. And Moshe was 120 years old when he died. His eye was not dim, nor his natural force abated. And the children of Israel wept for Moshe in the plains of Moab 30 days. So the days of weeping and mourning for Moshe were ended. And Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moshe had laid his hands upon him. And the children of Israel hearkened unto him and did as the Lord commanded Moshe. And the epitaph, And there has not arisen a prophet since in Israel like Moshe, who... Yehovah knew face to face, none like him for all the signs and the wonders that Yehovah sent him to do in the land of Egypt, to Pharaoh and to all his servants and to all his land, and for all the mighty power and all the great deeds of terror that Moshe did in the sight of all Israel. And that's the last verse of Deuteronomy there. Moshe, an incredible man who was remembered in the book of Hebrews for his great faith, Moshe the man who saw beyond the fleeting pleasure of this world and looked for what is yet to come. By faith, Moshe, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered 
the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking forward to the reward, just as Abraham looks forward to the reward, just as indeed we should. So we've just read the last verses of Deuteronomy. And if we jump to the book of Joshua, we see how the narrative continues seamlessly. After the death of Moshe, the servant of Jehovah, Jehovah said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moshe's assistant, Moshe, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I'm giving them to the people of Israel. Every place the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you just as I promised to Moshe. From the wilderness in this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites to the great sea, toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moshe, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to give to their fathers. Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all the law that Moshe, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you might have good success wherever you go. So be Hazach and Amatz. Be strong and courageous, equated with not being deterred from walking in all of Jehovah's ways. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous, as Achanamats. Do not be frightened. Don't be dismayed. For Jehovah your God is with you wherever you go. Repeat it of this promise. He will not forsake you. He is with you. It's the same thing that he says to us. He also tells us to be strong and courageous and not to be deterred from walking in his ways. Go walk in my ways. Don't turn to the left or to the right. The same message that Yeshua came with. Yeshua spoke to the multitude of his disciples saying, The scribes and Pharisees sit in Moshe's seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you, observe. That observe and do, but don't do after their works, for they say and do not. In other words, be strong and courageous. A mat is sure of your conviction to walk in obedience no matter what. Being careful to do according to all the law that Moshe, my servant, commanded you. Don't turn from it to the right hand or to the left. Joshua is told, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. Be careful to do according to all that is written in it. Then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. The message is found throughout Scripture as are warnings against disobedience. 1 Samuel 12. If you will fear Jehovah and serve him and shemad his voice and not rebel against the commandment of Jehovah, it will be well. But if you will not shemar the voice of Jehovah but rebel against the commandment of Jehovah, and the hand of Jehovah will be against you. It really is very straightforward. <laughs> part two. <clears throat> so let's go back to the beginning of the Parsha and take a look at Moshe's blessing for the tribes. This is the blessing with Moshe, the man of God, blessed the children of Israel before his death. And he said, Jehovah came from Sinai and rose up from Seir unto them. Shine forth from Mount Paran, and he came with ten thousands of saints. From his right hand went a fiery law for them. He love the people, all his saints are in thy hand, and they sat down at thy feet. Every one of every one shall receive of thy words. Moshe commanded us a law, even the inheritance, the Morashar of the congregation of Yaakov. He was king in Jeshruim, and the heads of the people and the tribes of Israel were gathered together. <clears throat> now here <clears throat> We have Moshe's blessings over the tribes. It's from verses 6 to 25, which we we'll shall look through as we go. But in Genesis 49, 3 to 28, it also covers blessings over Yaakov, over his sons. Of course, Yaakov's sons are the beginnings of the tribes. <clears throat> so we've got two sets of blessings over the tribes, or the sons, in the Torah. We've got Moshe's and Yaakov. So we'll look at the two of them uh, together. So <clears throat> before we begin, blessings were a big deal. We are made aware of this when we looked at the story of Yaakov and Esau. Uh, if you remember, 
this tale when um, obviously Yaakov dressed up like his brother to take the blessing. Uh, Yaakov deceived Isaac. He receives the firstborn blessing. Soon after Yaakov leaves, Esau arrives. Esau and Isaac begin to uncover what has happened and are extremely distressed. Genesis 27 says, Then Yitzhak trembled very violently and said, Who was it then that hunted game and brought it to me? And I ate it before you, and I have blessed him. Yes, and he shall be blessed. So, obviously, we know it was Yaakov who came. As soon as Esau heard the words of his father, he cried out with an exceedingly great and bitter cry and said to his father, Bless me, even me also, O my father. But he said, Your brother came deceitfully, and he has taken away your blessing. Esau said to his father, Have you but one blessing, my father? Bless me, even me also, O my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. So Isaac shook violently, and Esau wept. This is a big deal because the blessings are a big deal. <coughs> um, <clears throat> I'm beginning with uh, these blessings over the the sons. Yeah, we've got um, Reuben saying, Yaakov saying to Reuben, "You are my firstborn, my might, and the first fruits of my strength, preeminent in dignity and preeminent in power." So, <clears throat> first fruits of my strength. We see in Psalm seventy-eight fifty-one. Struck down every firstborn in Egypt, the first fruits of their strength and the tents of Ham. So this is reference to his um, his first son, Reuben. You are my firstborn. You are my strength, and the first of my children. Hard to be endured, hard and self-willed, <clears throat> is what it says in the Septuagint. And then we read, "Unstable as water, you shall have not have preeminence." Because, why? Because you went up to your father's bed, then you defiled it, he went up to my couch. This word here, um, pakaz, unstable, froth, figuratively, lust. Um, and it's from this word, pakaz, <coughs> um, which is from this word we see here. We can see the bubble or to froth up, to be wanton. Reckless, we also see haughty, boastful, reckless. We see this word used in Judges 9 4. Abimelech hired vain and light persons which followed him. In other words, people who were of no regard, people not great people. Her prophets are light and treacherous persons. Her priests have polluted the sanctuary, they have done violence to the law. So, for this language to be used over Reuben would have been particularly distressing for him. What happened that caused Reuben to be described in such a negative way? Unstable as water, you shall not have preeminence. Because you went up to your father's bed, you defiled it, he went up to my couch. <clears throat> the incident referred to here took place after the death of Raquel. Genesis 35. And when her labor was at its hardest, the midwife said to her, do not fear for you have another son. And as her soul was departing, for she was dying, she called his name Benoni, but his father called him Benjamin. So Raquel died, and she was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is, Bethlehem. And Yaakov set up a pillar over her tomb. It is the pillar of Raquel's tomb, which is there to this day. That's the um, favored wife. Israel journeyed on and pitched his tent beyond the Tower of Eber. While Israel lived in that land, Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine, and Israel heard of it. Now, the sons of Yaakov were 12. So after this favored wife dies, Reuben, okay, he goes in and <clears throat> takes his father's concubine. Now, what we have now is a listing of the 12 sons, which makes note of which mother they were all born to. Sons of Leah, Reuben, Yaakov's firstborn, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun, the sons of Rachel, Yosef, and Benjamin, sons of Bilhah, Rachel's servant, Dan, and Naphtali, the sons of Zilpah, Leah's servant, and Gad and Asher, these were the sons of Yaakov who were born to him in Padan Aram. So <clears throat> you can see here, um, obviously, with the favored wife dying, maybe Reuben thinks. Okay, maybe this is my time to make a move. Um, and this act here, what did it represent then? 
Is it just a case of Reuben unable to control himself in the moment, just lustful? As we've seen, he is described as pechaz, unstable. And it's worth noting that sleeping with his father's wife would have been seen as an act of usurpation, like I'm the head honcho now. We see something similar described in 2 Samuel Second Samuel 15. After this, Absalom got himself a chariot and horses and 50 men to run before him. And Absalom used to rise early and stand beside the way of the gate. And when any man had a dispute to come before the king for judgment, Absalom would call to him and say, From what city are you? And when he said, Your servant is of such and such a tribe in Israel, Absalom would say to him, See, your claims are good and right, but there is no man designated by the king to hear you. So the king was King David. Absalom would stand there and wait and tell everybody exactly what they wanted to hear so that he would curry favor. Then Absalom would say, oh, that I would judge in the land. Then every man with a dispute or cause might come to me and I would give him justice. In other words, the king, oh, he won't treat you right. But I would if I was the one who was in control. And whenever a man came near to pay homage to him, he would put out his hand and take hold of him and kiss him ingratiating himself. Thus Absalom did to all of Israel who came to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. <clears throat> the backstory, Absalom had a sister called Tamar. There was big trouble in the family when Amnon, the oldest son of King David, raped Tamar, Absalom's sister. When Absalom found out what had happened to his sister, he plotted revenge. Two years later, Absalom got his servants to get Amnon drunk, and then they murdered him. King David mourned many days for his son, and Absalom fled to Geshur, and David, although longing to see Absalom again, could not forgive him. Um, Joab, the commander of David's armies, tried to resolve the problem by inviting a wise woman to see David. And we read in 2 Samuel 14, 21, And the king said to Joab, Behold, now I grant this, go bring back the young man, Absalom. And after getting his servants uh, to burn Joab's field, <clears throat> very involved, so we have a son dissatisfied with his father. All we read of King David's reaction to the incident with Tamar is that he was very angry. Clearly, Absalom didn't feel that this offered justice. This isn't a big enough reaction. Absalom's angry with his father and half-brother and he took matters into his own hands. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. 2 Samuel 15 continued in verse 13. And a messenger came to David saying, The hearts of the men of Israel have gone after Absalom. And David said to all his servants who were with him at Jerusalem, Arise and let us flee, or else there will be no escape for us from Absalom. Go quickly, lest he overtake us quickly and bring down ruin on us and strike the city with the edge of the sword. So... <clears throat> the king's servant said to, to the king, Behold, your servants are ready to do whatever my lord the king decides. So the king went out and all his household after him. And the king left ten concubines to keep the house. So he flees. 2 Samuel 16. Now Absalom and all the people, the men of Israel, came to Jerusalem and Ahithophel with him. And Absalom said to Ahithophel, Give your counsel, what shall we do? Ahithophel said to Ablam, go in to your father's concubines, whom he has left to keep the house, and all Israel will hear that you've made yourself a stench to your father, and the hands of all who are with you will be strengthened. So they pitched a tent for Absalom on the roof, and Absalom went into his father's concubines in the sight of all Israel. Now in those days, the counsel that Ahithophel gave was if one consulted the word of God. So was all the counsel of Ahithophel esteemed, both by David and by Absalom. So this is the ultimate act of usurpation. Absalom enters Jerusalem to fully establish himself as king, and this is how he is advised to act. The consequences, 2 Samuel 18, 14, Joab took three javelins in his hand, thrust them into the heart of Absalom while he was still alive in the oak. If you remember, he got his head caught in the tree. But let's consider David. This incident with the concubines takes place on David's rooftop where his dealings with Bathsheba began to Samuel 11. It happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch, was walking on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing and the woman was very beautiful. David sent for Bathsheba and slept with her. She became pregnant 
And in order to cover up his sin, David sent Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, to certain death in battle. What we have after this is Nathan, the prophet, confronts the king in 2 Samuel 12. He says, why have you despised the word of Jehovah to do what is evil in his sight? You've struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says Jehovah, behold, I will raise up evil against you out of your own house, Absalom his son, and I will take your wives before your wives and give them to your neighbor and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of this son. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. And as we've seen, it happened exactly as prophesied. David sinned and there were consequences. And we go back to Reuben, Genesis 35, 22. It came to pass when Israel dwelt in the land that Reuben went and lay with Bilhar, his father's concubine, and Israel heard of it. And the sons of Yaakov were twelve consequences. 1 Chronicles 5, 1. The sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, for he was the firstborn, but because he defiled his father's couch, his birthright was given to the sons of Yosef, the son of Israel, so that he could not be enrolled as the oldest son. So Genesis 29, you're as unstable as water, you shall not have preeminence because of what you did. You went up to your father's bed, you defiled it, he went up to my couch, trying to establish himself as the main man. It's interesting that the incident with Reuben and Bilhar occurs after the birth of Benjamin to the favored wife, Rachel, and that the Torah then gives a list of who was born to whom, which includes a reminder that Reuben was the firstborn. Of course, it was Rachel's children that were favored. I've no doubt that this would have been difficult for Reuben to accept. As firstborn, he was supposed to enjoy preeminence. Sadly, his attempt to change things brought about diet consequences. And when the Israelites began to enter the promised land, the tribe of Reuben, along with the tribe of Gad, the half-tribe of Manasseh, requested to inherit the land east of the Jordan River. Moshe objected at first, asking how they could take rest from war while the rest of the Israelites went on to conquer Canaan and saying they were discouraging the other Israelites from going in to take the land Jehovah had given. He compared the Reubenites and Gadites to their fathers before them who had not wanted to enter the promised land due to fear the first generation. However, the men of fighting age promised to help the other tribes conquer their land and thus were given the land east of the Jordan as their possession. Following a similar trajectory to their namesake, the tribe of Reuben started off in a position of honor and strength, always listed first among the 12 tribes of Israel. But just as Yaakov prophesied, the tribe did not maintain an honored position. Moshe's blessing for the tribe of Reuben. Deuteronomy 33. Let Reuben live and die not. Let, his men, let not his men be few. Words that suggest... Maybe Reuben was in or going to be in decline. And then did in the LXX, it says, let Reuben live and not die and let not his men be a number. No prominent leader of any kind emerged from the tribe of Reuben, no judges, and aside from being referenced in a list, including the other 12, uh, the other tribes in Revelation 7, 5, the tribe is not mentioned anywhere in the New Testament. And that's in Revelation 7, 3. Eight, when it says, I heard the number of the seal, the 144,000 from every tribe of the sons of Israel. And now you see Reuben mentioned. So <clears throat> we have David who took something that was not his. Represents exalting yourself over the will of Yehovah. Right? It's not yours. This is coveting. This is, I want something that has been ascribed to somebody else. Jehovah has willed it this way, but I want to supersede Jehovah's will. I want to take this thing that is actually not mine. He abused his position and authority as king, and he faced the consequences. His kingship was threatened, and what he did in secret was repaid to him in public. Absalom, of course, um, was the, the one who brought this to pass. We have Absalom trying to take something that was not his also, which was the throne, trying to exalt himself, trying to put himself above his father. Dissatisfied, he sought to usurp his father. He also faced the consequences. Um, and it, similar, it had gone 
with Reuben. We have all these people trying to exalt themselves, make circumstances the way that they think they should be, and it just didn't work out for any of them. Trying to exalt yourself, Yeshua points out the unrighteous behavior of the Pharisees who love the glory that comes from men, and he tells the crowd who is the greatest among them. Right through scripture, you see these warning tales of people who seek to exalt themselves. It never goes well. Matthew 23, about the Pharisees and the scribes. They do all their deeds to be seen by others, for they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long. They love the place of honor at feasts and the best seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces and being called rabbi by others. In other words, they love esteem. They love people to look up to them so they can feel all big and full of themselves. Shiva says this, the greatest among you shall be your servant. He must have blown people's minds, must not even he was going about his business and speaking. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled. Whoever humbles himself will be exalted. And of course, we see this humbling in the stories that we've just looked at. People um, <clears throat> striving for positions, exerting their own will, and it doesn't go well. James 4.10 says, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. Now, one way we can be guilty of exalting ourselves is in trying to put others down. Looking down our noses at others, maybe even bad mouthing them. When we looked at Yosef, we noticed that a slanderer is one who seeks to exalt themselves by making others look bad. Yosef was a slanderer. He was proud. Now, Yehovah, the refiner, had to deal with him. And of course, he gave a bad report of his brothers, didn't he? An evil report of his brothers. He slandered them. Um, he was sold into slavery, as we know. <clears throat> He ends up um, in Potiphar's house and is accused um, of trying to have his way with her. He ends up in jail. He was humbled. Why? So that in due time he could be exalted. All this going on so that he might be conformed to the image of Yeshua. Yeshua who tells a parable and gives the same message. Luke 14. One Sabbath when he went to dine at the house of a ruler of the Pharisees, they were watching him carefully. Now he told a parable to those who were invited when he noticed how they chose the places of honor, saying to them, when you were invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not sit in a place of honor, lest somebody more distinguished than you be invited by him. And he who invited you both will come and say to you, give your place to this person, and then you will begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you were invited, go and sit in the lowest place so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. Reuben disrespected his father. He committed an act that spoke of his trying to elevate his own status. Trying to exalt himself. As we've seen the consequences with that. He was humbled. You shall not have preeminence. The sad thing is that in the story of Yosef, he seems to be righteous when compared to his brothers. Yaakov sends Yosef to his brothers in Dothan. And we see they saw him from afar. And before he came near to them, they conspired against him to kill him. But when Reuben heard it, he rescued Yosef out of their hands, saying, let us not take his life. He told them to throw Yosef into a pit, planning to return later to rescue the boy and restore him to Yaakov. In Reuben's absence, Judah convinced the brothers instead to sell Yosef. When the brothers traveled to Egypt to purchase food, Yosef recognized them and tested them by accusing them of being spies. Not knowing who Yosef was, the brothers contributed their current distress to their previous actions against him. And Reuben answered them, said, Did I not tell you uh, not to sin against the boy? But you did not listen. So now there comes a reckoning for his blood. So Reuben, out of all of them, is probably the most decent. And later we see Reuben put up his two sons as collateral, saying that Yaakov could kill them if he did not return with Benjamin. But Yaakov refused to let Benjamin go. But the famine persisted, so later the men did return after Judah offered himself as a pledge for Benjamin's safety. Reuben's promise meant nothing to Yaakov. Judah, who was the key player in the mistreatment of Yosef, his favorite son, meant more. 
Matthew 23, whoever exalts himself will be humbled and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. And of course, <clears throat> exalting yourself can include slandering people, speaking badly of them, giving an evil report. Now we have the Korah Rebellion, another attempt to usurp power. Who do we see involved? Number 16. Now Korah, the son of Izhar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, and Dathan and Avram, the sons of Eliab, and On, the son of Peleth, sons of Reuben, took men. They rose up before Moshe. The number of the people of Israel, 250 um, chiefs or princes of the assembly, chosen from the assembly, men of renown. They assembled themselves together against Moshe and against Aharon and said to them, You have gone too far. All in the congregation are holy, every one of them, and Jehovah is among them. Why then do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of Jehovah, accusing Moshe and Aharon of trying to exalt themselves, said by those who actually want to elevate themselves? And indeed, in Psalm 106, we read, When men in the camp were jealous of Moshe and Aharon, the Holy One of Jehovah, they were jealous, so they accused them. Who do you think you are elevating yourselves as they're trying to elevate themselves? Consequences, we've read about it. <clears throat> Obviously, the fire came down from heaven and the ground splits in two. Number 16, they went. All that belonged to them went down alive into Sheol and the earth closed over them. They perished from the midst of the assembly. And all Israel who were around them fled at their cry for, they said, lest the earth swallow us up. So, <clears throat> lessons from this. Maybe things aren't the way you think they should be. Maybe you feel overlooked or hard done by. But maybe you should just trust Yehovah. Maybe it would be better than trying to exalt yourself, exert your will on a situation in some way. Maybe you like to pick fault in others. You make a point of trying to frame them in a negative light. Maybe it would be better for you if you didn't try to exalt yourself. Isaiah 66. This is um, what we read verse 2 earlier. This is starting in verse 1. It says, Jehovah, heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. What is the house that you would build for me and what is the place of my rest? All these things my hand has made and so all these things came to be, declares Jehovah. But this is the one to whom I will look. He who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. Genesis 49 continues. And this is um, Yaakov's blessing for Simeon and Levi. Um, Simeon and Levi are brothers, weapons of violence, cruelty. Hamas are their swords. This word here, <clears throat> not um, injustice is part of what is included in the definition. These are two brothers who slaughtered the men of Shechem. Let my soul not come into their counsel, O my glory. Be not joined to their company. For in their anger they killed men, and in their, in their willfulness they have strong oxen. Uh, curse be their anger, for it is fierce, and their wrath, for it is cruel. I will divide them in Yaakov and scatter them in Israel. Not brilliant, eh? Imagine if you're sitting there and you hear this. It's like, oh. Now, the events that led to Yaakov's remarks, Genesis 34. Now Dina, the daughter of Leah, whom she had borne to Yaakov, went out to see the women of the land. Please note, throughout this episode, Yaakov is not where he is meant to be. Now, when she came, the son of Hamor the Hivite, the prince of the land, saw her. He seized her and lay with her and humiliated her. And his soul was drawn to Dinah, the daughter of Yaakov. He loved the young woman and spoke tenderly to her. So Shechem spoke to his father Hamor, saying, Get me this girl for my wife. Now it's often suggested that Dina was raped, but what's described here is a consensual sexual liaison. Now Yaakov heard that he had defiled his daughter Dina, but his sons were with his livestock in the field, so Yaakov held his peace until they came. And Hamor, the father of Shechem, went out to Yaakov to speak with him. The sons of Yaakov had come in from the field as soon as they heard of it. And the men were indignant and very angry because he had done an outrageous thing in Israel by lying with Yaakov's daughter, for such a thing must not be done. And it's worth bearing in mind that Shechem is not an Israelite. That's not to condone his actions, but just to recognize that he is somewhat ignorant as to what constitutes an outrageous thing in Israel. 
But Hamor spoke with them, saying, The soul of my son Shechem longs for your daughter. Please give her to him to be his wife. And then he says, ask, for, ask me for as great a bride price and gift as you will, and I will give you whatever you say to me. Only give me the young woman to be my wife. Now, in making this offer, Shechem, after having behaved wickedly, is now acting righteously. Indeed, in accordance with Exodus 22, if a man seduces a virgin who is not betrothed and lies with her, he shall give the bride price for her and make her his wife. If her father utterly refuses to give her to him, he shall pay equal money to the bride price for virgins. So this act of righteousness puts me in mind of what Paul says in Romans 2. For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the Lord is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness on their conflicting thoughts, accuse or even excuse them. On that day, when, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. So in other words, just because you might hear the word and think you're somehow in some privileged position, it's what you do that counts. And there's people who don't have the law who will actually act in accordance with um, the law. And on that day, um, what will be important is indeed how you have acted, not how much of the law you've actually been privy to hearing. She came and his father, although ignorant to Jehovah and his ways, in offering the bride price, show the work of the law written on their hearts. Ask me a great bride price and a gift as you will, and I will give Whatever you say to me, only give me the young woman to be my wife. And the sons of Yaakov answered Shechem and his father Hamor deceitfully because he had defiled their sister Dinah. So now there'll be a show of righteous indignation in order to justify the wickedness of their hearts. Levi and Simeon will demonstrate that they have no real interest in righteousness at all. They said to them, we cannot do this thing to give our sister to one who is uncircumcised for that would be a disgrace to us. Only on this condition will we agree with you that you will become as we are by every male among you being circumcised. Then we will give our daughters to you. We will take your daughters to ourselves and we will dwell with you and become one people. But if you will not listen to us and be circumcised, then we will take our daughter and we will be gone. So what happens? All who went out of the gate of his city listened to Hamor and his son Shechem and every male was circumcised. All who went out of the gate of his city. So they agreed to this. On the third day, when they were sore, two of the sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brothers, took their swords and came against the city while it felt secure and killed all the males. They killed Hamor and his son Shechem with the sword and took Dinah out of Shechem's house and went away. And the sons of Yaakov came upon the slain and plundered the city because they had defiled their sister. So in their anger, they killed men and in their willfulness, they hamstrung oxen is the way that Yaakov put it, Curse be their anger, for it is fierce, and their wrath, for it is cruel. So they took their flocks and their herds, their donkeys, and whatever was in the city and in the field. All their wealth, all their little ones and their wives, all that was in the houses they captured and plundered. Then Yaakov said to Simeon and Levi, You have brought trouble on me by making me stink to the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites and the Perizzites. My numbers are few. And if they gather themselves against me and attack me, I shall be destroyed, both I and my household. But they said, should he treat our sister like a prostitute? So acting wickedly and scratching it off as righteous behavior. But well, as we see by Yaakov's words over these two brothers, their behavior is recognized for what it is. It is especially cruel when you consider that the men of Shechem acted in a manner that seemed right to them. They acted in a manner which in respects to the offer of marriage and the paying of a bride price was actually in accordance with what we see in the word. As far as we know, they were ignorant as to what constituted an outrageous thing in Israel. But here are these people scratching off this disgraceful behavior as righteousness. Simeon and Levi assessed the situation. They were displeased and so took matters into their own hands. Again, what did they do? They exalted themselves. They didn't ask their father what should be done. And as we see by Yaakov's reaction, they acted in a manner which displeased him and caused him great concern. They certainly didn't trust matters to Yehovah. They looked for an excuse to condemn. Their actions 
were not applauded in the word. They were described as being cruel. Yaakov declared, O oh my glory, be not joined to their company. That is the distance in himself. Now remember that although Shechem and his father acted righteously in offering marriage in the bride price, what happened to Dinah was indeed an outrageous thing in Israel. But this would not have come about if Yaakov was where he was supposed to be. He settled in a place that was convenient, not the place he had vowed to go to. So here he is, he's in Shechem, he's supposed to be in Bethel. Bethel, he was almost there, but not quite. So he hadn't completely committed to his promise to Jehovah. He, <clears throat> he was half-hearted. He even built an altar as Shechem. And often people in disobedience seek to legitimize their decisions. A bit like his sons who were full of rage and anger and somehow wanted to couch how they felt um, in some kind of right, righteous clothing so that they could feel okay about what they were about to do. They said, should he treat our sister like a prostitute? Consequences of Yaakov's place of convenience, Genesis 34. Now, Dina, the daughter of Leah, whom she had born to Yaakov, went out to see the women of the land. We're called to be set apart. We certainly don't join in with behavior that we know to be displeasing to Yehovah. Yaakov almost obeyed. He almost got to where he said and promised that he would be at. And unfortunately, this almost is what caused um, his daughter to be defiled. She was not set apart. She went out looking for that which she shouldn't have been looking for. Of course, we're all called to be set apart. Indeed, Deuteronomy 12. <clears throat> this is what the Israelites are told as we look through the book of Deuteronomy time and time and time again. You shall surely destroy all the places where the nations whom you shall dispossess serve their gods on the high mountains and on the hills and under every green tree. Those calling themselves Jehovah's people were continually disobedient with regards to idolatry. You shall tear down their altars and dash in pieces their pillars and burn their asherim with fire. You shall chop down the carved images of their gods and destroy their name out of that place. Don't have anything to do with it. Of course, in our tale, Yaakov settled somewhere which was convenient. And this lack of being to me completely obedient to Jehovah, this choice of the convenient is what led to this lack of being set apart, this being defiled. There's to be none of that. You shall not worship Jehovah, your God, in that way. There has always existed a willingness to go after other gods amongst many of those who call themselves Jehovah's people. They want to go so far, they still want to be called his people, but they don't want to completely let go of all the rubbish. They'll sit in this place that's convenient and pleasant to them. The disobedient, those who have no love of the truth of the word, are guilty in this matter. Deuteronomy 12 continues, When Jehovah your God cuts off before you the nations whom you go in to dispossess, and you dispos but dispossess them and dwell in their land, take care that you be not ensnared to follow them after they have been destroyed before you, and that you do not inquire about their gods, saying, How did these nations serve their gods? That I also may do the same. So in this tale of Dinah, <clears throat> there's this warning, isn't it, about being sucked in. This warning about letting down your guard and maybe becoming ensnared. You should not worship Jehovah your God in that way. For every abominable thing that Jehovah hates, they have done for their gods. They even burn their sons and their daughters in the fire to their gods. <clears throat> the Lord says, be separate, be holy. Don't be people of comfort and compromise. Be completely mine. And of course... The people, as we've seen, do not pay heed time and time again. And we end up in this kind of place. <clears throat> we certainly do not join in with behavior that we know to be displeasing to Jehovah. That's what we're called to always have in our mind. Is this pleasing to Jehovah? Is this not pleasing to Jehovah? But behavior that is also displeasing to Jehovah is to forget justice and mercy. <clears throat> Compassion, kindness, and the belief 
darkness, exalting ourselves, forgetting that we are sent to be a light to the Gentiles. What kind of a message did Simeon and Levi send? Matthew 23, again, talking to the scribes and the Pharisees. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice, the mishpatim, and mercy and compassion, kindness, chesed, and the belief. These need to be done without neglecting the others. As mentioned earlier, we are a light when we walk according to the word. The word which speaks of Yehovah's great kindness. The word which tells us not to profane his name wherever we might be. So, <clears throat> when you think of these um, brothers who sought to condemn others and in a way to exalt themselves, to make themselves judge, to um, somehow couch their anger and wrath in such a way as to make themselves feel righteous. Um, there's a tendency sometimes, isn't there, to, um, to see those who are in um, error and maybe to become angry, um, maybe to feel righteous in it as well and to behave perhaps not in the best possible way. We are indeed to be completely holy and set apart to Jehovah, but we can never lose sight of the fact that we represent Jehovah. Um, we're supposed to be a light to people, and we can only be a light when we walk according to the word. The word which speaks of Jehovah in amazing terms, in terms of his great kindness and his love. When Jehovah declares his name to Moshe, he uses the word chesed twice. Now, we're called to bring glory to Jehovah's name. Exodus 34. Jehovah passed before him and proclaimed, Jehovah, Jehovah, God, merciful, racham, compassionate, gracious, long-suffering, abundant in kindness and truth. This word chesed. Kindness and truth go together. Truth, obviously, speaking to us of his word. Keeping mercy again, chesed for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. And that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children to the third and fourth generation. The sum of your words is truth. And every one of your righteous judgments is everlasting. Mishpatim and truth go together. Jehovah is a righteous judge, a God of judgment, but he is abundant in mercy and kindness indeed. Psalm 89, 14. Righteousness and justice, Mishpat, are the foundation of your throne. Mercy, chesed, kindness, and truth go before your face. So kindness, chesed, and truth go together. Mishpatim and truth go together. Kindness, chesed, and justice, Mishpat, go together. If we want to be like Jehovah and know kindness as he describes it, then we can only go one place, and that is the truth. That is his word. We see Jehovah's kindness revealed to us in his mishpatim. Remember, we are called to be like Jehovah. We're not called to be like Simeon and Levi who took matters into their own hands and pretended they were righteous while they were actually just being cruel. Micah 6 says, He has told you, O man, what is good and what does Jehovah require of you, but to do justice and to love kindness, to walk humbly with your God. To walk humbly with Jehovah is to walk in his ways as laid out in his word, to do justice as he defines it. Jehovah also requires for us to love kindness just as he does. And this is what brings glory to his name. We're called as a nation of priests. Living stones built up a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. A priest, okay, to act as a deputy or delegate, to stand up on behalf of such authorizing person and speak on his behalf. We represent our God. You know, to be conformed to the image of Yeshua, Yeshua is without sin. He kept Torah and he had compassion. We're called to be conformed to his image. Matthew nine thirty six. when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them, for they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Matthew fourteen fourteen. when he went ashore, he saw a great crowd and he had compassion on them and healed their sick. Matthew twenty thirty four. so Yeshua had compassion on them, 
took to their eyes and immediately their eyes received sight and they followed him. Psalm 145. I will speak of the glorious honor of thy majesty and of thy wondrous works and men shall speak of the might of thy terrible acts and I will declare thy greatness. You're awesome, Lord. You're almost like too much, quite terrifying. But men will also abundantly utter the memory of thy great goodness and shall sing of thy righteousness. For Jehovah is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, has said. Jehovah is good to all and his compassion, Racham, is over all that he has made. And we're called to bring glory to Jehovah's name. And this involves walking righteously before those of the world. 1 Peter 2.11 Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good works. Glorify God on the day of visitation. Good works, as we saw before, speaks of walking according to the word. The word which calls us to be people who have kindness, just like Jehovah has kindness, to have compassion, just like he has compassion. And let's not forget, though, the call to be set apart by walking according to the word. Sanctify them in the truth, your word is truth. And you shall be holy to me, for I, Jehovah, am holy, and have separated you from the peoples that you should be mine. Indeed, we don't go mixing, we don't go halfway, we don't be a people of compromise. We're to be completely separated. But we're to be a people who walks according to the word. And that's not a people who go about condemning others and finding excuses to vent our fury and anger and wrath. The word equips us for every good work that brings glory to Jehovah and it sanctifies us. So before we move on, let's look at what became of Yaakov and his family in that place that represented compromise. Of course, we have the incident with Dina. Then we read, Jehovah reminds Yaakov of his vow. God said to Yaakov, arise, go up to Bethel and dwell there and make there an altar unto God that appeared unto you when you fled from the face of Esau, your brother. So he's supposed to have been in Bethel all this time, and he's in Shechem, and the Lord says, come on. Bethel was, of course, the location where the altar was supposed to have been set up in the first place. He's built one in Shechem. As mentioned earlier, the altar Yaakov built at Shechem was an act of impulse of his own volition, not a Shema response. Many people's walk with Yehovah is simply them doing what they think would be good, dressed up all holy like a real act of devotion. But really, just a case of putting on a good show while compromising and doing the thing that suits them best. Isaiah 65. I spread out my hands all the day to a rebellious people who walk in a way that is not good, doing what? Following their own devices. A people who provoke me to my face continually. That's a dangerous thing to do, isn't it? I will destine you to the sword, and all of you shall bow down to the slaughter. Because when I called, you did not answer. When I spoke, you did not listen. But you did what was evil in my eyes, and you chose what I did not delight in. So Yaakov said to his household and to all who were in it, surprising <clears throat> to find this, put away the foreign gods that are among you. Purify yourselves and change your garments. Then let us arise and go up to Bethel, so that I make there an altar to the God who answers me in the day of my distress and has been with me wherever I have gone. So these people who are in this place of compromise, this place of convenience, who haven't quite gone all the way in completing what was vowed to Jehovah, these are the people who've lost their set-apartness, been defiled, but also a people who have gone after foreign gods. Ten years of almost following Jehovah, and this is what happened when we're not where we're supposed to be. End up defiled in filthy garments. We know what that speaks of. We're supposed to be wearing robes of righteousness, white, unblemished, without spot, and a household full of foreign gods. Finally, Yaakov and his household act faithfully in the very place that speaks of Jehovah's covenant promises. He's no longer an almost man of compromise, and he's committed. He actually goes through with what he has vowed. 
And they journeyed, and the terror of God was upon the cities that were round about them, and they did not pursue after the sons of Yaakov. And of course, he was scared, wasn't he? You've made me a stench amongst these people that are going to come after me. But he's doing the right thing, and he's protected. When we're fully surrendered to Jehovah, we need not fear man. And Yaakov came to Lutz, that is Bethel, which is the land in the land of Canaan, he and all the people who were with him. And there he built an altar and called the place El Bethel because there God had revealed himself to him when he fled from his brother. It is good to pay your vows to Jehovah. I wonder who that is. <laughs> Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and perform your vows to the Most High. Don't almost perform them. Settle for a place that's convenient to you, slightly compromised. No, perform your vows to the Most High. Part three. Back to the blessings. So, Simeon and Levi are brothers, weapons of violence, cruelty, Hamas are their swords. Let my soul come not into their counsel, O my glory, be not joined to their company, for in their anger they killed men, in their willfulness they hamstrung oxen. Cares be their anger, for it is fierce, and their wrath, for it is cruel. I will divide them in Yaakov and scatter them in Israel. Moshe's blessings for the tribe of Simeon. There isn't one. They are mentioned in Revelation 7, though, as you can see. Moshe's blessing for the tribe of Levi, Deuteronomy 33. And of Levi, he said, give to Levi your Thumen and your Urimin, Urim, um, to your godly one, whom you tested at Massah, with whom you cuddled at the waters of Meribah. He said of his father and mother, I regard them not. He disowned his brothers, ignored his children, for they absorbed, observed your word and kept your covenant. I think verse 9 represents a turning point for the tribe of Levi. I think this is a reference, of course, to what happened after the golden calf incident. So it says, I will divide them in Yaakov and scatter them in Israel. Prophecy of dividing and scattering turned out to be a curse for Simeon. They started out uh, from Egypt being the third largest tribe. Uh, at the second wilderness census of Israel, 63% of the tribe perished and they became the smallest tribe. And they end up sharing an allotment of land with Judah. You can see on the map. The prophecy of dividing and scattering became a blessing for Levi. They were scattered throughout the whole nation of Israel. They received no large tract of land. Joshua thirteen thirty three. But to the tribe of Levi, Moshe gave no inheritance. Jehovah God of Israel is their inheritance, just as he said to them. So Genesis 49 continues. Judah, your brothers shall praise you. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's son shall bow down before you. Judah is a <coughs> lion's cub. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He stooped down, he crouched as a lion, and as a lion or lioness, who dares rouse him. And all this language is very messianic. Revelation 5.5, 5, Yeshua is called the lion of the tribe of Judah. Um, this word, lobby, from an ancient, unused root, meaning to roar. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come, and until him shall, unto him shall the gathering, or in some translations, obedience of the people be. Binding his foal to the vine, and his donkey's colt to the choice vine. He was washed his garments in wine and his vesture in the blood of grapes. So, his donkey's colt to the choice vine. <clears throat> Possibly a description of Judah's material abundance. The vine, the choice vine. Judah's land was great wine-growing country. In the second part of verse 11 certainly uh, speaks of the Messiah. He has washed his garments in wine and his vesture in the blood of grapes. Garments washed in wine. <clears throat> right at the beginning of Yeshua's ministry, Luke 4. He came to Nazareth where he'd been brought up, as was his custom. He went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him and he unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who were oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, sat down, and the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. 
And he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing, committing the unthinkable by not finishing the quote from Isaiah, missing out what is yet to be fulfilled in the future, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. Clearly this day then has a messianic fulfillment. Shabu was quoting from Isaiah 61. And if we read on in Isaiah, we see mention of Yehovah's day of vengeance. We see the same imagery that we find in Yaakov's blessings upon the tribe of Judah. Isaiah 63. Who is this who comes from Edom in crimson gardens from Bosra? Who, he who is splendid in his apparel, marching in the greatness of his strength. It is I speaking in righteous, righteousness, mighty to save in crimson garments. Eh? Why is your apparel red? Your garments like one, like his who treads in the winepress. I have trodden the winepress alone, and from the peoples no one was with me. I trod them in my anger and trampled them in my wrath. Their lifeblood spattered on my garments and stained all my apparel. For the day of vengeance was in my heart, and my year of redemption had come. Uh, Revelation 19. He, Yeshua, is clothed in a robe dipped in blood. And the name by which he is called is the word of God. This all obviously points to Yeshua and points to the day of vengeance. Back to Genesis 49. His eyes are darker than wine and his teeth whiter than milk. And there's a much more wonderful translation found in the Septuagint. His eyes shall be more cheering than wine and his teeth whiter than milk. Amazing. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. Yeshua is referred to as Shiloh, the name meaning he whose right it is or to whom it belongs. A title understood to speak of the Messiah. And from David until the Herods, a prince of Judah, was head over Israel, even Daniel in captivity. The promise was that Israel would keep the scepter until Shiloh comes, till the Messiah comes. Even under the foreign masters during this period, Israel had a limited right to self-rule until 7 AD. At that time, under Herod and the Romans, their right to capital punishment, a small but remaining element of their self-governance, was taken away. At the time, the rabbis considered it a disaster of unfilled, fulfilled scripture. Certainly, though, Yeshua was alive then. Of course, they did not recognize him. Now, Moshe's blessing for the tribe of Judah. Deuteronomy 33. This he said of Judah, Hear, O Yehovah, the voice of Judah, and bring him in to his people. With your hands contend for him, and be a help against his adversaries. Back to Genesis 49. <clears throat> Yaakov now skipped the birth order, moving to the tenth born and ninth born sons, but keeping his focus on the sons born of Leah. Zebulun shall dwell at the shore of the sea, he shall become a haven for ships, and his border shall be at Sidon. Babylon noted for his faithfulness to David in 1 Chronicles 12. Of Zebulun, such as went forth to battle, expert in war with all instruments of war, 50,000 which should keep rank, they were not of double heart. And we have mention of Issachar, yes, is a strong donkey, Oof. crouching between the sheepfolds, don't know what that bit means. He saw that a resting place was good and the lamb was present, so he bowed his shoulder to bear and became a servant at forced labor. Mm. <laughs> Don't know what to make of that. So, <clears throat> Moshe's blessing for the tribe of Zebulun and Issachar. Zebulun, he said, rejoice, Zebulun, and you're going out in Issachar in your tents. They shall call peoples to their mountain. There they offer right sacrifices and they shall partake of the abundance of the seas and the hidden treasures of the sand and they shall partake of the abundance of the seas both the tribes of Zebulun and Issachar were in the Galilee region and were blessed to take advantage of the sea of Galilee back to <clears throat> Genesis 49 Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel the tribe of Dan did judge his people supplied one of the most prominent of the judges which is Samson Dan shall be a serpent in the way, a viper by the path that bites the horse's heels so that his rider falls backwards. I wait for your salvation, O Yehovah. So 
but Dan shall be a serpent in the way. They introduced idolatry into Israel. If you look at Judges 18, Jeroboam set up one of his idolatrous calves in Dan, and later Dan became a center of idol worship in Israel. Maybe this is what's being referenced. Moshe's blessing for the tribe of Dan. And of Dan, he said, Dan is a, Dan is a lion's club that leaps from Bashan. Back to Genesis. Raiders shall raid Gad, but he shall raid at their heels. Or um, Gad, a troop, shall overcome him, but he shall overcome at the last. The language is obviously not that easy to translate, which is why you get such vastly different translations. The tribe of Gad supplied many fine troops for the later king of Israel, David. Troops shall tramp upon him in the days of Jeremiah. Among other times, foreign armies oppressed Gad. Now, Asher, Asher's food shall be rich, and he shall yield royal delicacies. The land eventually occupied by Asher was good enough to bring not only necessities, but also luxuries. Naphtali is a hind let loose. He giveth goodly words. He uses beautiful words. Naphtali's land was in a key position near the Sea of Galilee, the region where Yeshua did much of his teaching and ministry. Moshe's blessing for the tribe of Gad. Of Gad, he said, blessed be he who enlarges Gad. Gad crouches like a lion. He tears off arm and scalp. He chose the best of the land for himself, for there a commander's portion was reserved, and he came at the heads of the people with Israel. He executed the justice of Jehovah and his judgment for Israel. Uh, Moshe's blessings for the tribes of Naphtali and Asher. Of Naphtali, he said, O Naphtali, sated with favor and full of the blessings of Jehovah, possess the lake and the south. Uh, <clears throat> also could be, um, he gives goodly words. And of Asher, he said, most blessed of sons be Asher, let him be the favorite of his brothers. Let him dip his foot in oil, which can be seen to be speaking of. Let him be having riches. Your bars shall be iron and bronze. And as your days, so shall your strength be. Back to Genesis 49. Yosef is a fruitful bough, even a fruitful bough by a well whose branches run over the wall. The archers of Saul, he grieved him and shot at him and hated him. His bow abode in strength and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Yaakov. From thence is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. Even by the God of thy father, who shall help thee, and by the Almighty, who shall bless thee with blessings of heaven above Blessings of the deep that lies on the blessings of the breasts and of the womb. The blessings of thy father have prevailed above the blessings of my progenitors unto the utmost bound of the everlasting hills. They shall be on the head of Yosef and on the crown of the head of him that was separate from his brethren. Moshe's blessing for the tribe of Yosef. And of Yosef he said, blessed by Yehovah be his land, the choicest gifts of heaven above, and of the deep that crouches beneath with the choicest fruits of the sun and the rich yield of the, mount, of the months and the finest produce of the ancient mountains and the abundance of the everlasting hills. With the best gifts of the earth and its fullness and the favor of him who dwells in the bush, may these rest on the head of Yosef, on the pate of him who was prince among his brothers. So <laughs> you're getting these blessings that you'd be one, the brothers who got a bit of a not great one. One of the brothers who got one, they don't know what to make of it and at Yosef's, that's pretty good, isn't it? Moshe's blessing for the tribe of Yosef continues and says, A firstborn bull, his majesty, his horns are like the horns of a wild ox. With them he shall go the peoples, all of them, to the ends of the earth. They are the ten thousands of Ephraim, and they are the thousands of Manasseh. Back to Genesis 49. Benjamin shall raven as a wolf. In the morning he shall devour the prey, and at night he shall divide the spoil. And apparently... They were indeed a ferocious bunch. Ocean's blessings for the tribe of Benjamin. Of Benjamin, he said, the beloved of Yehovah dwells in safety. The high God surrounds him all day long and dwells between his shoulders. Perhaps dwelling between his shoulders being alluded to here is the fact that Jerusalem was a Benjaminite city. So <clears throat> there we are. We've been through the Torah cycle once more. Now we look forward to the feasts. <clears throat> course we've already had some of the feasts let's just quickly look at Yeshua and the fulfillment of the feasts there's our Passover lamb he was the bread of life without sin and without the wrong doctrine of the Pharisees he was resurrected on first fruits Shavuot the spirit was poured out and signaled the restoration of the kingdom see Pasha Hukat and here we go 
We're just about to go into the Feast of Trumpets, Day of Atonement, the Feast of Tabernacles. The fall feasts speak of the end of the age and are yet to be fulfilled. So Coates speaks um, of the married supper of the Lamb, Revelation 7. For the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of waters, and Adonai will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Revelation 16 says, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watches and keeps his garments. We are to make ourselves ready. Revelation 19, <clears throat> Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come. His wife has made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in linen, clean and white for the linen. High linen is the righteousness of saints. And the angel said to me, Write this, blessed are those who were invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true words of God. And of course, we go into these feasts and we think of what is yet to come. And we go into the Feast of Trumpets and we think of trumpets being an alarm call and a wake up call and a call back to repentance. And then we go into the, the Avion Kippur, which is like the holiest day you would say of the whole year. And um, all these things, it points us to this day, the day of Yom Kippur, which speaks of returning to the land. It speaks of um, the Lord's day of vengeance, um, Yeshua's return. And then we think of Yom Kippur, uh, sorry, Sukkot, which um, points to this amazing um, thing that we look at here, the marriage supper of them. And he said, these are the true words of God. Is he sure he's coming back? He's coming back for a spotless bride. Not one laden down with foreign gods and nonsense with garments that are filthy and dirty. He's coming back. To simply put it like this, he's coming back for a bride that loves him, one that walks in his ways. That is completely surrendered to him. Completely his. Shall we pray? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you um, that we've been through your um, your tour again this year. Thank you, Lord, that you continue to lead us and guide us and to teach us about who you are. Lord, for, I pray for these feasts that are coming up. I ask, Lord, that we would keep them in a way that would be pleasing to you, that would um, bring glory to your name. Thank you, Lord, for everyone who hears these teachings that have gone through this year. And I just pray, Lord, that um, you would help each of us to, to assess, to look in your word, Lord, and see things as they truly are, to see ourselves as they truly are. And, Lord, to be doers of the word, not just people uh, who hear. I am... Um, I pray, Lord, for people who this might be new to and they're just coming to realization of who you are. I pray, Lord, that you'd bless them with understanding, that you'd encourage them. And I, um, I thank you, Lord, for bringing us together as your people so that we can encourage one another. And... Um, that we can enjoy walking in your ways together and share what a delight it is. Thank you, Lord. Amen.